Welcome to the TD K-12 podcast. I'm here to help you navigate the exciting world of living overseas, being an expat, international teaching, and more. I was an expat living and working overseas from 2002 until 2019. After relocating, I decided I wanted to share information I had for those people who might be looking to go overseas and those people who are already overseas and looking to make a move. So join me for this podcast, and if you want to watch on YouTube, the podcast is on YouTube with some visuals. There are links both in the podcast show notes and on YouTube. Please subscribe and hit the like button if you like this. Let's get started. Welcome back to TDK12.net. This is Episode 7, Understanding the Package, Part 3, Healthcare. I thought this would just be a three-part series until I finished the healthcare and I realized it was so long, we're actually going to have a part four. Part four is going to be on housing and all the remaining things you need to consider. Healthcare is such a big topic, I really wanted to spend um, enough quality time on it because for some people, it literally makes all the difference in the world into whether or not they accept a contract or not, all right? So let's dive straight into... Understanding the package part three, healthcare. Let's start with healthcare categories. I have really thought about this and I tried to make it as simple as possible. There are three basic categories of healthcare that you receive overseas. Now, if you're an American, you are not prepared for this information. You need to take a deep breath and sit down. In some, in some ways, it's going to blow your mind. Everything you know about healthcare is basically irrelevant for working outside of the United States. So all the instincts that you might have, all the anxiety you might have, you need to put that aside. It's not going to serve you. If you are from Canada or the UK where you have some form of single-payer, government-sponsored healthcare, some of these plans are very similar to, to what you have now. However, I think you're going to find that you have a lot more flexibility in most cases. And here's the other thing you're going to have, speed. I know from experience that when dealing with like the Canadian healthcare system, sometimes you have to wait a really long time for things that you need. Just keep an open mind. It's very important that your current experience with healthcare, if you're from North America or a country with single payer, is kept just off to the side so that you can have a very objective view of what we're talking about today. Okay, healthcare categories. Category number one, local healthcare only. That sounds really bad, and in some places I suppose it could be. Local healthcare means that the healthcare options you have available for you are only within the country you're employed in. So, for example, I had local health care when I lived in Japan. My health care was great. I actually did pay for it. Um, I paid a, a small monthly fee after the second year that I lived there. And I had access to all the hospitals, doctors, etc. But I couldn't use it outside of Japan. It was local only. It isn't very common to be offered local health care if you are at a school where the teachers are required to have certifications. So if you're working somewhere and they require you to have a teaching certificate from your country and a four-year degree, it is very unlikely that you're going to have local health care. It is likely that you might have something called VIP health care, and that's, a, that's more common in certain places in Asia. So it's, it is local, but you have access to private and or international clinics. And in an emergency, I think you can lobby to leave the country uh, to go for treatment somewhere else. But it's local health care isn't that common. Why was I on local health care? Because I wasn't working at an international school. I was just living in Japan. I had two or three jobs. Um, and I was studying Japanese. And the rules were everybody had to have health care. And it was based, the cost of health care was based off of your income the year before which I still think is was amazing for me because the first year I wasn't employed, so it was free. And the second year I wasn't making a lot of money, so it wasn't that expensive. 
Um, and that's why I had local health care. International, private, not worldwide. This is the most common. And it, it basically means that your home country is not included. So international, private, not worldwide literally means the entire world except where you are from. That's normally what the rules are. And in some cases, it does work in your home country. If you're an American, it is very rare that you will have health coverage that also works in the United States. And if you're Canadian or from the UK, usually because you already have a national health service or a single-payer system, you can't use it because you're already on another plan, so you can't use two. Um, if you're a Canadian and you are wondering, okay, if I become a non-resident, do I still get to keep my provincial health care? Email me directly. TonyDepredo at gmail.com. Email me directly, and we will discuss that. I have lots of experience with that, and I can explain everything that I know, and I can even put you in touch with someone who knows how to do the paperwork and who understands the law very well. International, private, worldwide would be the thir third major category. This is the best, absolutely the best healthcare plan you can get. You literally can go anywhere you want, including your home country, and get treatment. Sometimes to go to your home country, you do need to get approval, but it's usually not a huge problem. It's amazing in the summers because you can travel in the summer home and also get uh, get appointments out of the way if you want to. Um, if it has a dental or vision, you can do that in your local country. If you're living somewhere where dental and vision is just not up to your, uh, you know, up to your standard, or it's just weird, you know, like I, I wear glasses and contacts. I like to buy my contacts from a couple of companies in the United States. I've always found them to be very reliable. They're comfortable for me. I prefer to do that. And if I can use my healthcare to do it, you know, why not? International, private, worldwide, I've had once. Uh, the full, the full, like you can use your healthcare anywhere you want, including the United States, and it was great. And I would say that if you have a job that, and the offer is $55,000 a year, and it comes with international, private, worldwide, versus a job that's maybe $65,000 a year, like 10000 more, but it comes with like international, private, not worldwide, I would consider the lower salary, and this is why. Number one, that school probably has lots of other additional benefits, such as professional development and other things. Schools that carry that top-level health care, I, I seem to find that they have amazing benefits besides just salary for you and for your family. Also, international, private, worldwide, that's going to include wellness and a bunch of other stuff. And what does that mean? Well, that means that you won't you won't have to worry about waiting to get sick or waiting to get injured. You can do preventative care. You can do physical therapy. Um, you can do acupuncture. You, you can basically take care of yourself on a regular basis. And the long-term benefits of being healthy are going to probably outweigh the short-term gains. And, you know, money on your first salary, that's just your first contract salary. That's not your whole life at that job. You're going to have opportunities if the school provides opportunities. And you're going to be able to get raises and, and other things. And I just find that schools that offer top-level health care seem to offer a lot of other things that can make your life better. The health care checklist. So when you are interviewing with a school or when you are looking over a contract, even if... And, and I like to open this up to all expats, not just people working in education... When you are looking at a contract or discussing a contract and you get to the healthcare part, here are the things that you definitely need to check. First, what are the, what are the coverage maximums? Now, you see this everywhere around the world, but this is very important. When I was in Korea and we were having a baby, the coverage maximum for Having a baby all in was $13,000. If you're an American, you're like, man, that, that's not going to be enough to have a baby. If you're Korean, 
and you spend more than $3,000 having a baby, something's wrong. Meaning no one's ever gotten to that maximum unless something really, really bad happened during the process. The doctor explained to us that if we hit our coverage maximum for the pregnancy and everything, that would have meant that our little baby would have probably been in the hospital for up to six months. So again, coverage maximums are important. You need to look at the coverage maximum and then have a little bit of like understanding about what that money buys you in the country you're considering moving to and in other places. Um, you know, most of the time coverage maximums are fine. I would say if you're taking a posting somewhere in Africa where the cost of goods is extremely high, you would want the coverage maximums for healthcare to be quite high in case you need to do a medical evacuation or something. Because even if the local available health care is affordable or free, if you have to use a private service to get out of the country, it's going to be incredibly expensive. I have a friend who is not a teacher, but he's been working overseas for like 15 years. He works all over the world. He works in some really uh, rough places. They're, they're tough to live, tough to work, developing areas. His coverage maximum for evacuation is $200,000. So in most expat or international insurance packages, there's something about evacuation insurance to get you uh, somewhere in, in case you, you need a better level of care. And his, it's $200,000 for him. And I asked him once, like, okay, what does that get you? You know, how, how is that, you know, is that enough? And he said, if I'm in Kazakhstan working, it's enough. If I'm uh, in South Africa working, I'm probably going to have to pay extra money out of my pocket. Next thing you want to look at in your checklist, is there direct billing or is it a reimbursement plan? There are some amazing plans on the market that schools provide uh, expat teachers that are, it's basically 100% coverage, no deductible. However, for non-emergency treatment or anything classified as non-emergency treatment, you have to pay the bill in full or up to a very high limit, and then you get reimbursed 30 to 60 days later. So it is zero deductible, zero cost, but it's also more like a cash flow issue. They're low cost to the school, obviously. Newer schools or schools that are operating in places where they're trying to bring new educational services might have to use something like that to make sure that teachers have what they need. Um, often in a, in a very extreme situation, phone calls can be made and no money has to be, be paid out by the teacher. But you do want to know, is this a direct, do you have direct billing or is it reimbursement? There is in-network and out-of-network everywhere. You know, it's, it's very common even with international, private, worldwide that they say, look, here's your network. There could be 20,000 clinics and hospitals in the network. And as long as you go to those, it's direct billing. But if you decide to go to one that's not, you're going to pay out of pocket and then have to wait for reimbursement. Um, why is waiting for reimbursement on all that important? Paperwork is paperwork. And getting reimbursement and going through the reimbursement process anywhere is annoying. And, you know, one situation that comes up often is you could end up somewhere, you know, you're on, you're on vacation and you have an injury and you have a reimbursement based plan. So you go to the hospital and let's say you're in Thailand and you, you pay for it in Thai bot, you know, and you get all your receipts, you, you have all your paperwork, you do all your forms, you submit them all before you leave Thailand, everything is fine. 30 days later, you're back in Japan. The reimbursement comes through and you're like, oh, wait a second, um, what, what's wrong? Something's wrong. You're, like, you're looking at the amount, it doesn't make sense. There's been some kind of conversion of currency and it's, it's messed up, it's wrong. And the money has been deposited into your Japanese yen account or some kind of U.S. dollar account. And now you're thinking, 
Um, how much money have I lost? So the reimbursement process, somebody made a mistake with the currency and um, now you're short. I've actually seen that work the other way. So I had a friend who did this kind of reimbursement and they actually made a thousand dollars on their healthcare bill. That's it, for this exact reason. They were in one country, submitted the paperwork. It was processed in the wrong currency and sent to their bank account um, in their favor. On your healthcare checklist, number three, do you have a choice of countries in case of a major issue? You are working in Cambodia in an amazing, beautiful school. You love the, the kids. You love your coworkers. You have a great place to live. It's hot and sticky, but you don't care. And one day you are walking on the street like you always do. You're crossing and you get clipped by a scooter. Uh, very, very likely to happen to, you know, a lot of people. You get clipped by a scooter and it snags your purse and pulls you to the ground, drags you, and you get hurt pretty badly. Did that actually happen to somebody? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I know at least two people that's happened to. Luckily, they didn't get hurt very badly. But that is a scenario you're in Cambodia. Where is the best where is the best healthcare for you? Emergency healthcare in Cambodia treats everything and you're okay, but you have uh, some pretty bad damage to like your leg and your hip and you're not sure if it's structural or not. You need an MRI and there's damage to your skin and you would really like to have that cosmetically fixed. You're going to Bangkok. You're not doing that in Cambodia. You're going to Bangkok, world-class hospitals, amazing treatment options, everything you need, and fast. Does your insurance help you get there? You need, to dis you need to know if you have any choice of countries if you get injured. If, if you don't have a choice of countries and you have to do everything uh, in the country where the injury happens, so I'm not saying that it's local insurance, I'm saying... You got injured in place A and you want to go to place B. And they're like, no, if you get injured in place A, you need to stay in place A. If you don't have your choice of countries, you need to uh, consider that as um, kind of a negative. Most good plans give you some choice, not unlimited, but some choice. And they let you call and like work it out with a provider. And they have an agent and they call around and they'll talk to your local doctor and They'll work with you and try to help you get the best care that you can, at least regionally. Regionally. If you don't at least have regional options and you're living somewhere where the local options aren't great for, um, let's say, high-end diagnostic medicine, MRIs, etc., then I would say that that's a negative. Healthcare checklist number four. In the event of a serious condition, is your employment protected and for how long? I myself had to, a few years ago, had to have a procedure on my ankle, and it was planned well in advance, and uh, the doctor was like, you know, we really don't want you to walk on your ankle for four months, and I was like, what? It's going to be impossible, so I went and talked to my, my school, and they said, you know what, we have a, you know, our healthcare doesn't provide this, but this is what we provide. They protect your job. They let you work for so many days. It was almost like two or three months, full salary without coming in. And then they can give you another like six months extended leave of absence at 70% salary. So you can go home, you can do whatever you want. You're getting, you know, they're, they're, keep in mind, they're paying for the housing the whole time. They're paying for the insurance. You're getting 70% of your salary and you've been out for over a year. Amazing. There are some places where the healthcare package itself has insurance built in to help you if you can't go to work for some time. Other places, that is provided by the school. And some schools have never thought about it. So they take it case by case. The next topic within healthcare, healthcare dependence. And are they included? Yes, in most cases, dependents are included. You need to ask. Just it's usually right at the top there when you get any kind of healthcare documentation. Confirm like if dependents are included and uh, confirm what a dependent is. 
So if you're in a non-traditional relationship in your country and your country recognizes that relationship um, legally and you're like, hey, you know, let's move to country C and country C does not recognize that relationship based on the paperwork that you have, that person would then not be a dependent. You want to confirm and be very clear with the school. Do not go into an interview and tell the school that you have a, quote, partner if in your home country you and your partner are legally married because your expectation will be that you have a married spouse in terms of the benefits that they receive. If you just say you have a partner, the school might think, oh, you know, they're not legally married, so in their home country, they're obviously not a dependent, etc. Um, they may also think that your partner is going to pursue their own work visa and their own type of employment, so they aren't, they aren't going to need any services provided from the school's health healthcare plan. Huge mistake. Be upfront. Be clear. Don't use language that is just comfortable. We're talking about you leaving your home country to a new place that has different rules, different laws, and you don't want to take a job somewhere that is going to put your dependents in a bad situation. Pregnancy and maternity. When I first moved to the Middle East, there was a big issue during orientation because one of the teachers had shown up and she was pregnant. And she was married and everything. She was just pregnant. And um, the school had a big problem because their insurance policy, and I don't know if this was influenced by the government, their insurance policy would not cover pregnancy unless that pregnancy began six months after the contract. So if your contract started August 1st and you were pregnant in September, it didn't matter. You would, you're not going to be covered. So you needed to wait six months before you could use the insurance. It would work after six months, no matter what. But you couldn't just start using the services as a pregnant mother. And, um, let me tell you, that wasn't, that wasn't good. Um, the school worked it out and I'm pretty sure they just paid for it themselves, but, um, you don't want to be in that situation. When my wife and I were looking at having a child, we probably did two weeks worth of research around pregnancy and maternity policies. It's different everywhere. And you, if it's, if you're, if you're either pregnant and at the same time looking for a job, you definitely need to be upfront about that. If you get a job, you know, and this, this is really common. So you, you get your job in like November. So you're, it's November, you sign a contract, you don't start until the next August, you end up pregnant in the spring. Well, now you're going to arrive pregnant and you're going to need to use those benefits immediately. You need to update the school. You need to call them. You need to let them know. I'm not saying you need to tell them immediately. I'm not saying that. I am saying that if between the contract signing and the visa issuance and arrival at the school, between those two points, if you do get pregnant, you need to let them know so that there's a plan in place to help you. The next item under healthcare is healthcare term length. When does it start and end? Does it work before you get your final visa or work card? And do you have a condition that will require medication before your health care can be used? This should all be disclosed in your contract, and this should be something that you discuss um, if if it's uh, relevant to your condition, if it's relevant to you and any health conditions that you have. Working backwards from the last question. Do you have a condition that will require medication before your healthcare can be used? You may be someone who needs blood pressure medication or something like that. You're working somewhere until June 1st. Your healthcare may be where you're working is good until July 1st. 
Your job overseas starts August 1st. That's a month, and you probably can plan for that. Talk to your doctor, get your medication. When you arrive in your new country with your new life getting started, can you go to the doctor within the first week and start using the healthcare? Or do you need to wait until your visa and work card are processed? Some, and I would say many, countries give you a temporary visa telling the immigration people you're arriving for work and then after you get into the country you go through a health check and a bunch of other stuff and then you finally get your work card in your passport or your final visa in your passport a couple weeks later. So you're really just looking at these gaps. Are these gaps going to impact you? To be honest, they don't impact a lot of people. Most people deal with it just fine. Um, however, um, if you have a very, you know, a treatable condition and you're concerned about it, you need to disclose that. Disclosing health issues is important. And if there's an emergency, guess who's going to need to know about your health condition? Your employer. You should at least have a plan if you have a condition that might require emergency assistance. Final thoughts on health care. Um, I think most people are perfectly capable of comparing plans. I believe the secret is to put aside your current prejudice about health care, wherever you live, your current opinions about the politics surrounding it. Put all that aside, read the details, compare what you're going to get. Remember that if you're living somewhere where the facilities for healthcare are not too standard or they're not going to meet your needs and you're not allowed to go anywhere else to get treatment, that's probably a huge mistake and you want to avoid that. Also remember, really good healthcare plans come with everything you need to stay healthy and preventative care is just going to improve your quality of life. This isn't just getting screenings. This is massage, physical therapy, everything you need to feel better, things you can do after work every day. Um, and those things long term, I believe, will benefit you more than a few thousand dollars more in salary um, with a really bad health care plan. And finally, emergencies, most emergency care is standard. Um, if you just compare emergency care, you're going to find it's exactly the same in almost every situation. So what you're really looking for are those additional benefits that you get that are going to help you when you're traveling, help you when you have a, a long-term situation that needs to be dealt with, and uh, can benefit your dependents and other members of your family who are traveling with you and under the same plan. All right, that's it for healthcare. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions, email me at tonydepredo at gmail.com. I am happy to take them. I have a lot of experience with healthcare overseas. Unfortunately, I have injured myself um, in really stupid ways. And so um, I've seen a lot of doctors and I'm hoping that that experience can benefit you more than it benefited me at the time that it happened. And uh, thank you for listening to tdk12.net. If you watch this video on YouTube, please like it or hit subscribe. And if you were listening through a podcast or on the website, please also find a way to give us some stars like it or just send me some feedback.